Welcome back, 1570. Today we are doing accelerated motion on an air track. Of course, we're not using the air track, we're using the PASCO software. Hopefully you found it useful uh, last week. We're using the same system. Uh, we're collecting data in the same exact way. Your analysis will be a bit different though. But um, okay, let's get started. We have, we started with a level track then I put these two risers uh, below the feet on the left-hand side. So we have it at an incline. You'll have to determine what that incline is. And I'll give you a few measurements shortly so that you'll be able to do that. Here is our cart. It's on the tracks. <clears throat> and I will start collecting data when I release it. So here we go. All right. I just collected the data and that concludes our data acquisition portion of the lab. But uh, I should say a few words about that data. Uh, last week we used a frequency of 100 hertz. For this lab here, the um, rider travels down the uh, length of the track uh, quicker so we could put it on a smaller frequency. And we did that 50 Hertz. So that is written up here. And I put it on a frequency that would give us the same amount of data points that are listed on your table in the lab manual. In the lab manual, I saw that there are uh, 80 rows. So um, let's see, we got we're a little bit short. I think I see, I'm looking at my monitor right now, I think I see 77 data points. So you'll be in that area. You, you won't be able to complete that graph uh, table in its entirety instead of 80 data points. You'll be in the high 70s. And um, again, you will need the Hertz. It is 50. As a reminder, the um, measurement error in these positions is that plus or minus 0 0.0001 meter. Now we need to determine, if you let, read your lab manual, what our L and H is. So I'm assuming you know what I'm referring to um, when, I, when I speak of these measurements. And what I'll do is put you on pause and take this track apart just a little bit. So what you need to do is measure L and H. The L would be the distance between the feet. So what I did was um, tip this upside down and unscrew the feet so that I could see the holes be be that these feet um, screw into. I mean, I could have done it a different way, but without going into it, I think this is the most accurate. Uh, on the chalkboard here, You'll see a diagram. Let's say these represent the holes and you want to measure the distance uh, between those two holes. So obviously it's center to center. That's where your L is. Uh, a more convenient way would be like measure that edge and this edge. So what I will do is get a meter stick and place it between those two holes and photograph this for you. I'll put the camera overhead so that you can see um, the init initial position of your measurement and then take a photo overhead of um, this screw hole and you can get your final position. And when I place this uh, meter stick on the track, I'm not gonna like adjust it so that one end is like perfectly at zero or anything like that. I mean, it, this, this is your job to determine what the L is. I'm going to place this at an arbitrary position. I mean, it, it'll for sure be right across the uh, diameter of the screw hole, but it'll be up to you to get the best uh, measurement for L as you can, and I'll put that lens right over the edge so you can uh, get
get an accurate view based on the photo. So that's how you get your L. For your H, we use these risers. There's two here, one for each uh, foot on the left side of the track. So for your H, all you need is this length here. And to make that measurement, we're going to use a vernier caliper. And I'll send you a photo of that. Let's see. I made sure I used the same type of caliper that is illustrated in your lab manual. Your lab manual does a pretty good job of explaining how to use one. So I used the same type that they used. I took a picture of the um, of this in the caliper's jaws. Then I zoomed in on this on the scale so you can get an accurate reading. And for this, let me think. There's two scales. One is in inches, one is in centimeters. You never want to use inches, right? The centimeter scale is the scale on the bottom of the caliper. So just <laughs> keep that in mind that you are looking at the right scale. So let's see, let me just go over it in my head real quick. You have enough information to get the height that we raised one edge. You have the data to determine the length of the base that'll give you the slope of the incline. And we're all set. You, well, I erased it, but you had the frequency of these acquired data points. You have the air associated with those data points. Oh, so there obviously is also going to be air uh, in your reading with the uh, meter stick and with the uh, vernier caliper. That, I'll leave that up to you. There's um, inherent air in those instruments and how you read them and, and, and that should be explained in your lab manual. But another quick one, I will see you next week. Hey there students, I wanted to say a few words about um, your results. I just did some quick uh, calculations and got it's about 10% error. If you get the same, don't be discouraged. I didn't mention that there is um, more friction involved with this system here, unlike the air tracks where they're actually elevated above the track so that there's no contact between object moving and the actual track. Uh, furthermore, with the rider on the air track, its motion is uh, purely translational. With this smart cart, some of the force imparted on it goes into not only translational motion, but also rotational mo motion. These wheels need to turn, which have a moment of inertia associated with each one of them. Of course, they try to minimize that. They are um, as skinny as can be, as skinny as uh, they can make them and then not break. So there is a practical limit. Um, and they are made of plastic, so it's low mass, but uh, nevertheless, they they need to rotate and they are on an axle that, uh, <clears throat> although uh, pretty good, does produce friction. So uh, at 10%, I think we're good.